Welcome to the Free Library of Philadelphia. My name is Jennifer McGuire Wright. I am a librarian here at the Free Library of Philadelphia, and I'm excited to introduce John Palfrey. John Palfrey is a leading scholar on the legal issues of emerging media and an authority and advocate for internet freedom, transparency, and accountability. He is the head of school at Phillips Academy, director of the Data Plus Society Research Institute, and the president of the board of directors of the Digital Public Library of America. His latest book, Bibliotech, argues for the necessity of understanding how to find and use the seemingly infinite reservoirs of online information, as well as the adaptive role of libraries in teaching these skills. Amy Ryan, president of the Boston Public Library, says of Bibliotech, he challenges all of us to keep the library relevant as an information resource, cultural archive, a community gathering place, and most powerfully, as a cornerstone of democracy for an informed citizenry. Please join me in welcoming John Palfrey to the Free Library of Philadelphia. Jennifer, thank you so much for your kind introduction, and thank you, Andy, and all those who have welcomed me here to the Free Library of Philadelphia. I could not be happier than uh, to be in this very space to talk about this new book called Bibliotech. Um, there are many reasons why this is an appropriate place to talk about this book, but of course the amazing history that Philadelphia has from the Library Company of Philadelphia and Ben Franklin, a Bostonian by birth and Philadelphian by uh, his adulthood, um, his role in shaping the library in this country, and of course the amazing Free Library of Philadelphia and many other great institutions right here. Um, I think in many respects that we are at an historic moment when it comes to information, when it comes to knowledge, and when it comes to libraries. And I think this spans across education and journalism as well as in libraries. And I think they're all in an interesting way connected. Um, but I also think that they all hinge on the same set of questions about whether in a digital age we can make our institutions as effective for democracy as they have been in the analog age. Um, and in funny ways, I think there is actually some risk that they might not be. And so part of what was uh, driving me to do this project and to work on this book, uh, Bibliotech, was really a series of conversations that I have had over the last several years with uh, people that have surprised me on exactly this question. And um, the, they've gone sort of this way. I, I uh, five or six, uh, six years ago, began uh, being the head of a library. It was the Harvard Law School Library, which is in academic library terms, um, probably the biggest one. And I was not a librarian by training. I was a law professor. Um, there are lots of really great librarians who work there, don't worry. Um, it was not a, a, a dangerous situation. Um, but it was one where uh, I think people were surprised about uh, who were my friends, um, why I was working in a library. And so I had the same conversation a whole bunch of times over and over again, say at a backyard barbecue or at a cocktail party where somebody would come up to you and say, what are you up to? And they said, well, I'm uh, still teaching at a law school, but I'm about to start running a library. Um, and they would kind of look at me funny and say, you know, why would you do that? You're not a librarian. I'd say, it's true, I'm not trained as a librarian, but I really think they're important for a variety of reasons. Then they would say, oh, you're the digital guy. You work on digital stuff. And now that we have Google, we don't need libraries, right? You're going to shut down the library. Um, and then I would say, wait, 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 no, no, not at all, actually. I think they're more important than ever. But by then, my friend would be off in some other direction, and you know, I would never get back to make the case for why libraries are, in fact, more important, not less so in the age of Google. So I decided to write a book to convince all those people who will probably not read it, um, but that it's actually more important than ever uh, to have libraries in a digital age. I happen, really, to believe it. In some respects, I was inspired uh, by this picture, which comes from the image vault that we have at Harvard Law School Library. Um, I doubt that anybody in the audience will be able to guess what this is, but it's the private library of Oliver Wendell Holmes, Jr. Um, he was uh, a law professor at Harvard and then became a Supreme Court justice. And this is actually his private library in Washington, D.C. And I like this picture for a whole lot of reasons. One, it just appeals to me. I love the idea of kind of sitting in that chair in the middle of this, uh, this room and thinking about Mr. Justice Holmes writing his opinions. And for any law professors in the crowd, you know that he wrote some wonderful opinions, um, which you can imagine him writing that right there. He also wrote some clangers of opinions that um, he would no doubt have regretted if he read them later. But no doubt he was inspired, you could imagine, by all this knowledge surrounding him in the form of these books. And you could sort of imagine him standing up and grabbing a book off the shelf and reading it and then sitting down and writing some more opinions. 
And today, I'm the principal of a high school, Phillips Academy in Andover, Mass., um, which is an amazing high school. And it's got kids who are between the age of 14 and 18. And I think a lot about what kind of a learning environment are we creating for kids like this particular um, uh, environment here? What would it be like for these kids to have a place where they would be inspired the same way that Mr. Justice Holmes would be um, at this, uh, in this particular moment? And I'm imagining that it probably won't look exactly the same. Um, maybe they too would be inspired by this kind of a space. Um, but when I was a library director, and actually see, thinking about the, the kids who are at Andover today, it's clear to me that when kids go into a library, they don't actually do a whole lot of this. Um, and I should say, at Harvard Law School Library and at the, the library at, at, our, at our high school, the libraries are very full. Like, tables are packed with kids, elbow to elbow. They're in there. They're doing their work. They're doing their homework. But they're not taking a lot of books off shelves. They've got their computers. They might have a book that they've been assigned. But by and large, they're not there, you know, kind of for the stacks. So the question in my mind is, as we build libraries going forward, if the point is not necessarily to be a collection of books, of physical objects for these kids, how do we make just as inspiring and just as wonderful full of space when, in fact, meant much of the information is not located in this physical form. The reason to come to the library is not necessarily um, for these physical objects. And I think that's an important challenge for us to meet. The other part of the challenge is that there is a public view um, that libraries are not as necessary for a variety of reasons. Um, this is a very recent quote that I happened to find on the Amazon page uh, for the book that I wrote, and it's just somebody who happened to comment and didn't seem to like the book for a variety of reasons, but one of the reasons was he just disagreed, I think, with my premise about the importance of libraries and wrote, public libraries are on their way out. Like every government-supported service, they're being squeezed financially until they can no longer provide service, and, you know, and so forth. It is not a particularly uncommon experience to be in a town or a city and to see the pressure that is on libraries today. So at a local level where most of the funding comes from, we know that often you have to make a decision in a local budget between supporting the fire department or the police department or the schools or a library. Um, and my view is that the money is so short in relative terms um, to support a library and the payback is so great that it is a crazy thing to cut libraries. But we know that that pressure comes every year on libraries. Um, I was so glad to see um, that the Penn Foundation has supported this library with $25 million, the biggest gift. But of course, that's private philanthropy stepping forward as opposed to you know, a big city grant to make a transformational gift. You look at the state level, and there's a lot of pressure on libraries. I recently gave a talk about this book in Kansas City at the wonderful Kansas City Public Library. There, a week before or so, the governor of Missouri had been making a plan to cut the state funding for libraries, and 75 young people had gone up um, and had uh, uh, done a sit-in in the gov governor's office and been thrown out by the state police, which was very dramatic and exciting. Um, but it was, a, it was sort of a showdown about state funding for libraries. And, and I should say, actually, one of, a, a junior at our high school was one of the kids who was um, involved in that protest, and I was very excited that she was acting in, with such civil disobedience on behalf of libraries. I was proud of her spring break activities. And uh, at the federal level, even President Obama, who I admire in some respects, um, uh, he has, you know, his budgets have included cuts at a federal level for uh, funding for libraries. And so we have uh, pressure, I think, in all directions uh, on libraries. And at the same time, more need than ever, I think, for their services um, in a democratic institution. So how do we make a positive argument for libraries um, in this digital age? I think that's actually important um, for our democracy. I think it all goes back in some respects, though, to why we had public libraries, free libraries to begin with. And in uh, this country, a lot of the history dates back to the middle of the 19th century. Um, this particular image comes from Boston Public Library, which is my local library. And the most important part about it, in my, uh, my view, is if you can see just above the door are these three amazing words, which are free to all. And I still get chills down my spine every time I see them. The idea that you should have an institution the whole point of which is to say no matter how much money you have or where you come from or what your education level is, you shall have access to the knowledge that is necessary for you to be informed and engaged and delighted in a democracy. Um, and the fact that this seemed radical in 1850 is sort of amazing because of course now it seems, uh, seems obvious, 
but the entire movement for public libraries um, sort of kicks off at this moment in our country. Um, I realized that instead of that slide, I should have had this picture, which is the, um, the Free Library in Philadelphia. That's, of course, a few years later in American history, um, but growing from, I think, a very, very similar um, kind of civic pride and civic importance um, uh, in our country. And, of course, the Carnegie uh, libraries, uh, which have spread out to 1,600 communities across the country, are another expansion of that early in the 20th century. So we have an amazing and proud history of this expansion of public libraries across our country. Um, and I think that we are at another moment where we have to think about what the next chapter is for public libraries and libraries of all sorts. And the reason that that I think is so crucial is that increasingly the knowledge that we create and that we curate in our society is held not in physical format in the first instance, but in the cloud. So um, it is not to say that we will not have books. That's not the argument. I still think that this particular technology is a great one um, of physically holding uh, the material in this format. Um, but clearly when we create information, it's primarily created in a digital format and access not through the physical format necessarily, but often um, through these little devices, increasingly uh, mobile and increasingly cloud-based. Crucial to this part of the story is also that those who hold the knowledge in the cloud are private actors by and large. So if you look at the names that are in any image of the cloud, it's almost all private companies. There are not public spaces online in the same way that we have public spaces in the analog world, in the physical world. And I think that distinction actually really matters. Um, I think it could matter because uh, we, if we don't, in fact, keep information in public hands, knowledge in public hands, and provide access on a free-to-all basis in a digital era, I think that could exacerbate many of the problems that we have in our society between the haves and the have-nots. Imagine a world in which what libraries do is only meter access to uh, information that is uh, held online when many people who have access to funds um, can just buy whatever they want and bring it on, on their Kindle. That, to me, isn't a great outcome, um, ultimately, for libraries. And it's not a crazy potential problem. So a few years ago, in particular, those who work in libraries know that there have been a series of tussles between publishers and libraries about trying to figure out what's the basis on which we're going to lend electronic books to, uh, to individuals. Just out of curiosity, how many people here, if you were to read, just say, a novel, would prefer it in this format, in a printed form? How many people prefer it? So a very strong majority of the, the crowd. How many people prefer an ebook? actually? I would say... Aha, so it depends on how big the book is. So there are varieties. Um, that, I would say, is about a quarter of the audience. How many people are more or less agnostic? agnostic? You're happy to read it in either format. A couple of people. So I put myself in that third category, which is at night I like something like this to be beside my bed, you know, bedside table and pick it up and, and touch it in this way. It's easier to fall asleep after that. But if I'm on a plane, as I was from Boston today, it's actually much easier to have all those books you can have on the Kindle. That's kind of a wonderful thing, except when the battery runs out and, um, or when you're taking off and landing and you're not allowed to use it. Right? Um, uh, but increasingly, it's that third category. It's people who, um, the growth, I think, is in that third category. People who actually um, often like um, digital books as well as physical books. People who buy a lot of digital books also tend to buy a large number of physical books. So um, the, the, the habits are changing very quickly. But at the same time, publishers are very worried about what their business model is going to look like. So many publishers have not allowed libraries to license on the same terms to the digital books as physical books, um, particularly the most uh, uh, valuable and sought after books uh, in the first run. Um, so off the bat, librarians have been in a very difficult position. In a digital era, are they going to be able to do the same things that they've done in an analog era. If you think about the role of uh, librarians of bringing a series of physical objects to a place and then being able to lend it out, um, that's a wonderful and important right that libraries have, which is once they've bought this book under US law, you can really do anything you want with it. You could tear it up, right? You could give it to someone else. You could sell it at a secondhand bookstore. And librarians have you know, very broad rights to do what they want with it. In a digital world, it's not so. Librarians go necessarily from being owners of the physical material to renters, to leasers of the material. And if librarians stop paying those royalties and licenses to the booksellers, um, to the publishers, um, they might actually not even have a collection, right? So it's sort of a, it's a very different world. And some of the contract terms have actually been pretty obnoxious. Some contract terms have said things like, um, you can't read the book aloud if you have a digital version of it, right? Sort of a crazy idea. Um, one of the ones that librarians um, made the most uh, appropriately stink about was an early, uh, early agreement uh, between booksellers 
publishers, or publishers and, uh, and libraries. And in that arrangement, um, the libraries were told, you may lend it 26 times if you buy it. So the idea was, if you purchase the book, you may lend it back and forth 26 times on the premise that after 26 lends, the thing would have dissolved, right? It would have gone away. Which is hard to imagine, right? A physical object like this would, would have gone away. That rule um, has not held up, particularly as the way that ebooks are sold. But you see the problem, which is that librarians may be in a position in a digital world not to do the same lending on a free to all basis in the same way that they've been able to do historically. And that seems to me a perverse outcome. It seems to me not a great version of the future if in a digital era, when there's actually much more potential for ubiquitous and broad access, that we actually have less access for uh, the public on a free-to-all basis. And it seems to me we need to figure out how to head that off. The exciting part, though, from my perspective, is we're at a moment where we can design a bright future. We can, in fact, imagine a different kind of a future to build from. This image shows the building of the Boston Public Library. You can imagine a similar um, uh, image of the building of this uh, this particular uh, edifice that we're in here. Um, and what, why I like this moment is that I think we are, um, as we were 150 years ago, at a moment where we can figure out what do we want the future of libraries to be when it's a combination of the digital and the analog. I think we are at a moment when if we step forward and we invest in this future and we have very strong democratic principles behind it, that we actually can create something vastly better than what we have had in the past, that builds upon the best of what librarians um, have done in public libraries and private libraries and actually what is happening in Silicon Valley and on the web um, that has uh, brought us, I think, very broad access and very exciting uh, developments in technology. Um, but I think we have to think like designers and we actually have to build um, like innovators in new and exciting ways. Um, I often think about this particular uh, design, which is the, uh, the building that I worked in at, at Harvard Law School. This is the side elevation of Langdell Hall. And if you imagine what it was like to build a great library like this one or, or like Langdell, you imagine the process that people went through. It involved, uh, I think, bringing together architects with teachers and librarians and students and people who are going to use it. And you imagine what would a space look like, a space for teaching, a space for people to come in and, and do their work. And you think about these kind of um, glorious environments. I think we're at a similar moment now for libraries in the digital future. Bless you, where what we need to do is to bring together the information architects of the digital age together with the librarians and the users um, uh, of today and along with people who have designed both physical um, and, uh, and digital spaces. And I think this is a, a moment where we can make something that is really, really exciting. If you scroll back um, a little over a century, um, you may know of the language in the charter for this uh, particular institution, the Free Library of Philadelphia. And in that charter, it said um, there was a commitment on the part of the city to build a free library of Philadelphia for the use of the people of Philadelphia, a general library which shall be free to all, that same language that's on the door above the Boston Public Library. So for my mind, this is the moment to pivot to uh, building something, an institution and a set of systems that will support the, uh, the public in a similar way, only in a digital era. Um, and uh, several years ago, uh, a group of people came together, and this happened at Radcliffe Institute in, in Cambridge, Mass., um, where people made a similar kind of commitment. A group of 40 people said, um, what we want to do for the future is to build something that will be a platform for libraries, um, that will be an open distributed network of comprehensive online resources to draw on the nation's living heritage from libraries, universities, archives, and museums to educate, inform, and empower everyone in the current and future generations on behalf of our country. Now this sounds like a crazy naive thing to say on some level, but I actually think it is a similarly historic kind of commitment that would undergird all of these fabulous physical institutions that we have and support them in crucial ways, um, only to do so in a way that's designed for the digital era and to connect the digital and the analog. So you might say that sounds really good, um, but what in fact uh, do we need to do to create such a thing? Um, and I think in a way what we need to do is to step back and say, what are the elements of a library in a digital age? What are the things that we need to create that will in fact be supportive of libraries, not in any case a replacement of what happens in a physical space like this, um, but something that's going to support it. Clearly, the most important thing in libraries is actually the librarians. So I think about this particular book, Bibliotech, and I wrote it really as a love letter, a love letter to libraries as institutions, but to librarians as people, because I think ultimately uh, the people who work in libraries and who 
uh, serve our society, whether it's a, a research library at a university or a public library like this one, are providing a completely essential uh, uh, service in our society. I think some of the best teachers in schools, in fact, are our school librarians who support our kids as they're trying to learn digital techniques or they're trying to learn um, research. Um, so ultimately, I think it's about training um, and development of, of humans. Um, but it's also thinking about libraries in structurally quite a different way than we have in the past. And one of the arguments that I uh, make in this book and, and think we need to, uh, to pivot toward is to stop thinking about libraries only as individual institutions that potentially are actually a little bit competitive with one another and see libraries as, pl as platforms in a networked world. Now this may sound like technology jargon and to some extent it is, um, but I actually think it's important technological speak because I think in this moment, one of the things that libraries can do best is actually to draw on other aspects of uh, innovation in our society. I think there's been so much amazing development, whether in Silicon Valley or in um, places with very large uh, uh, commitments to R&D in the technology world to develop things that libraries actually haven't yet done. Um, and I think if we take those same techniques that have made the internet and the web so powerful and apply them with the kinds of skills and the kinds of commitments that librarians have, I think we can make something really terrific. And I think we can do it in a highly collaborative way. So if you think about libraries as not necessarily being standalone institutions that all try to collect the same physical objects in a slightly competitive way, and I know when I was working as a librarian at Harvard, there was a sense that we were competing on the size of our collection. Like it was, if we had the biggest stack of books, then we had the best library. I think that's an old way of thinking about it. Rather, how can we collaborate as well as possible to serve directly the communities that we have? So in thinking about this Digital Public Library of America, we've been thinking about building a platform, a system ultimately, that will support all libraries and be something um, that will bring uh, both materials together, um, but also to bring people together in a way that's really productive. Um, this is, I think, the most technical that my slides get for this presentation, but really what it's describing is an open system with lots of open code that uh, technologists and librarians create and can share, um, and can share in a way that accesses information that has come um, from all libraries, and then where anybody can export that information and create different forms of it um, to serve particular communities. So four years after that commitment to make an online uh, national library, which we have, um, it actually can be found online. So if you have a smartphone here, you can go to dp.la and you can access the Digital Public Library of America. Um, it is now a few years old. It has uh, contributions from 1,600 uh, institutions from around the country um, and more than 10 million objects that have all been curated by librarians. Um, and what's exciting about it is it has drawn upon um, many of the big institutions in the country. So the National Archives has materials in there and the Smithsonian, um, the big public libraries like New York Public Library have been uh, major supporters. The universities like Harvard and University of Virginia have um, digitized millions of objects to share in this, in this way. And any library or any person can take those materials and download them and do whatever they want with those particular materials through this website or otherwise. Um, and ultimately, we're seeking to build something that will be a truly national resource. Um, you can see from this map that the uh, map of the country is filling up. The notion is that for every state, we hope to have a hub that will allow people to digitize materials and share them on a national basis. About a third of the country is now covered with state hubs. Um, you will notice that Pennsylvania is a hub in development. Um, we're hoping that um, before too long, this library and others in the state will have a mode for digitizing the unique resources that are here and sharing them on a national level. Um, but let me give you an example from uh, Massachusetts, which is uh, lit up in uh, the red color over there. In Massachusetts, the way it works is that um, there's a statewide system run out of the Boston Public Library, which is called the Digital Commonwealth. And the notion is to say, in Massachusetts, there are 351 cities and towns. And what we uh, want to enable and do enable is for any institution, if you're a little local historical society, um, or actually if you're an individual or you're a school like Phillips Academy where I work, you can say to the Digital Commonwealth, come to our uh, historical society and bring the things that you think are unique and scan them. And then the librarians do the really critical work of adding what's called metadata, sort of the catalog records effectively. Um, and then that information goes into the statewide system, the Massachusetts Digital Commonwealth, 
and with the Digital Public Library of America, it then goes up into the national system so that um, these little collections that are all around the country um, can then be pulled up into um, this national system and accessed from anywhere. And you can imagine it's kind of an exciting idea that the cultural resources, the, her the um, historical resources from all around the country can be accessed uh, in the same way. Um, and you might think that's sort of what the web does anyway or the internet does anyway, but it turns out the way we've been digitizing materials um, it's actually very hard to access things that are held in different hands. Um, we've spent millions of dollars digitizing aspects of the Harvard um, collection, but I defy you to find them without actually having kind of an on-ramp um, to find them uh, collectively and applications to show them. One of the dreams that I have is that before too long, the Digital Public Library of America will have a system called the Scanabago system. Um, I didn't think this up, a colleague, Emily Gore, did. Um, but the idea behind the Scanabagos is that we would get some Winnebagos and we would outfit them with scanners in the back. And you can imagine, you know, retired librarians or library students or even just volunteers driving across the country in these Winnebagos and they would pull up in a town and they would say, you know, bring out your scans and people would bring out these really amazing unique photographs or books or, uh, or images um, and they would get scanned in the back of the Scanabago and then um, the librarian or the, the person driving it could help figure out what the metadata is so you could situate who was in the picture or the moment and so forth. Um, you can imagine, so the documentary writes itself of driving the Scanabago around the country. Um, I have written a letter to the head of the Scanabago uh, company, uh, the Winnebago company, who has not written me back yet um, with, an, with an idea that this would be good. So we might have to call it the Airstream something or other if we can't get the Winnebagos to work. Um, but you get the point, which is that there is, I think, across our country, um, this amazing store of knowledge and information. And in a digital age, there's no reason that it has to be cooped up and local. It actually can be held in, uh, in common hands. Um, and I think we could have a really extraordinary resource um, that would combine what is in the great libraries, the great libraries like the Free Library of Philadelphia and the New York Public Library and Boston Public Library and the National Archives and Harvard University and Pen uh, University of Pennsylvania Library with all of these other collections. And you can imagine the new knowledge that we would create if in fact we had those materials together. It would be like creating that digital library of Alexandria that people have dreamed about for a long time. It is a ways uh, between here and there, but I actually think it's entirely in sight. And I think it could be something that would not replace any libraries, but it would supplement. It would be something that any library like this one could curate in really interesting ways for local communities and could take advantage of what um, uh, is held in other hands. So the notion is really to create something that will amplify the work of, uh, of libraries. I also think that the idea is to improve upon some of the things that uh, have been wonderful in the analog era. So one of the fears I think that, that many of us have is as we transition from the analog era to the digital era that we will lose some of the ways in which we've learned in the past. Um, one of those examples is the idea of serendipity. So you may have one of the, the lovely images in your mind of going into the stacks with a call number and kind of looking around at all these amazing books. And if you're anything like me, you would see the book that you were after, but then you'd see all these other books that somebody had cleverly put over there and some other books over here. And then as you're walking out with your arms full of books, um, you realize you come out with nine books, but you only had the call number for one book, right? This amazing idea that when you get into a space and the information has been well organized, um, and if you have, you know, sort of a little bit curious in your brain, um, you can't help but learn these things. Um, you might think the same way about the New York Times in the morning or the Philadelphia Inquirer, the notion that when you read a story that's here, you didn't know that you were interested in the stories that were laid out in different places, but clever journalists and editors have presented information in a way that the serendipity, uh, in fact, informs you. So if you think about a digital era, that could possibly go away, right? If we took the books off the shelves and we didn't actually have stacks and all you were doing was using a mo you know, mobile device to get the call number and then download that one book, you might lose all of what was kind of around the, uh, around the book. Um, that's one fear. Another fear people have is that maybe what would in fact be presented as the other things in the serendipity environment would be created by a, a private company as opposed to by librarians. So um, if you think about where many of the recommendations come from these days, it's from Amazon or it's from Netflix, right? That's a very different thing than having people who are scholars in the field and um, knowledgeable librarians actually thinking about how to array information for you. So all of that said, I think it is possible that in a digital era we can do just as well, if not better, if we think about clever ways to array information and to present it in a way that will be just as good. 
Um, so this is just one tiny example of that um, called Stack View or Stack Life. Um, this is an application that has been built to work with the Digital Public Library of America, and it's meant to address this question of serendipity and saying, can we actually create, for instance, a digital browsing environment that might be different, um, but in a really positive way, um, and to bring serendipity back into the digital environment? Um, so the example that's up here is of somebody coming to, uh, in this particular case, the Harvard collection of books, um, and searching on Thomas Pynchon, Gravity's Rainbow. So you could think of a, gr a graduate student doing this, um, doing this search. Um, and one of the interesting things about Harvard's library system is that there are 73 different libraries. There's not one Harvard library, there are a whole lot of them. And in this city, right, there's a main library, and then I think you have 61 branches, right? And then you also have the Library Company of Philadelphia, and you have Drexel, and you have Penn. You've got lots of different libraries. So ultimately, there's actually not one stack. So we love this idea of serendipity, but there's actually not one place where all these books are arrayed. But digitally, you could do that. You could actually create that infinite stack that showed all of the things that are available. If you think about New York City, there are three different library systems across the five boroughs, right? There's Queens and Brooklyn and all of the New York publics. So in a digital space, you actually could show all of what's available. And then if you did it really well, you could also use some of the great information, the metadata, that libraries have about the data, about the books. And you could array the information in ways that are really clever. So in this particular case, the way these books are arrayed um, is uh, based in part on circulation data. So it looks at the books and says, how many times has a particular book been circulated? And you may want to pick out a book that nobody has looked at for 100 years, or you might be interested as a graduate student to know what version of this particular book has been checked out most recently. And you might say, actually, I want to know which version of Pynchon has been checked out most recently by my professors, right? Um, or you might say, as an undergraduate, which one are graduate students most likely to have checked out? So in this case, the version of Mason-Dixon has been checked out 100 plus times, um, and other ones have been checked out much less recently. Another example you might think of would be going into a library and wondering um, which version of the Iliad should I read? There are lots of translations and lots of forewords. Um, and you might find information that's presented this way that you would never be able to find if you were just staring at a bunch of books in front of you. So you could imagine adding lots of intelligence that would actually make the browsing experience more effective and not necessarily just be what Amazon is trying to sell to you or what Netflix is trying to sell to you, but in fact something that is customized in a really interesting way to your particular needs. Now, is this going to be better than the stacks? It doesn't have the must and the nice smell or whatever that stacks have. It doesn't have quite the same uh, experience, of course. Um, but in some ways, I think if we were to unleash the really interesting power of innovation and, and think clearly about what communities need, I actually think we could create something that is just as good, if not better, in the digital space to supplement what happens in physical spaces. Um, and I think that's what's very exciting about where we're headed. Ultimately, I think what libraries need to do in this next period is to think about solving problems that people have in communities. And I think this is happening in the best of libraries. I think this is happening in the best of digital libraries. And I think it's happening in the best of physical libraries. Um, I think it's about creating uh, infrastructure, a digital infrastructure that will support what's happening in physical spaces and connect those two in really interesting ways that align uh, the, what libraries do um, with what communities ultimately need. Um, here in Philadelphia, I think you guys are doing this incredibly well and incredibly interesting ways. The 21st Century Libraries Initiative, which uh, I know is uh, resulting in a transition of many spaces that are here, but also really do, doing a deep inquiry into what are the needs of this particular community? What are the needs of Philadelphia that we can meet in different ways with the digital space as well as with a transformed physical space and calling upon um, foundations like the Penn Foundation and the foundation I work for, the Knight Foundation, um, to give funds to this team and to figure out how do we transform libraries in a way going forward that are incredibly powerful and useful. And ultimately, I think part of what we're going to find is that we actually need not just this digital space and these digital exciting applications, but we still need amazing physical spaces. We need places that inspire people, that bring us together, that bring us into an environment that is connected around ideas. This particular image is from a place outside of Boston, um, the Adams Library, which was uh, of the, the presidential family, the Adamses. I think it's one of the most beautiful library spaces out there. And I think it would be a shame if as we make this transition to a digital age, we didn't have these inspiring spaces. So uh, I just want to underscore this point that it's about combining the best of the physical um, uh, with the best of the digital, ultimately. 
Um, but I think what will bring people into these rooms, these beautiful rooms, is not just um, the architecture. In some ways, this, this particular image makes you think of a museum, right? It makes you think of a uh, historic space. Um, what's arrayed on the table are reference books. I think some of the things that libraries have done to draw people into a space, for instance, for reference, those things are going to go away. I think the greatest references are going to be Wikipedia. They are going to be things that are online, well curated, and so forth. And it's not to say Wikipedia is perfect, but um, it absolutely, I think, has the potential to be the best encyclopedia in the history of the world. So I think for libraries to imagine ways to cooperate and build and make those online spaces as, as amazing as possible, but not rely on the things like reference to pull people into the spaces um, as in the past. I do think that um, to take an image from the Library Company of Philadelphia, it is also important to recognize the amazing preservation role um, that libraries have. I've made an argument tonight mostly about access to information, but I also think it's crucial to remember the, the essential role that libraries play in our society that is to say, preserve our cultural and historical record. Um, one of the experiences I had as a library director was being very surprised when on multiple occasions, publishers actually came to me to ask for access to physical books they had because they wanted to digitize them. And then I would say to them, so why are you coming to me? I'm a library, don't you have the books? Um, and the publishers would say, no, we own the rights to them, but we don't actually hold any versions of the books that we published. This was in multiple instances. And part of it was because they had acquired companies that had gone out of business. So you know, publishers are often kind of big roll-ups of, um, of other companies. For-profit companies that are publishers have a crucial role to play in our knowledge economy, absolutely. But they are not the long-term players who should be preserving our culture. In fact, public-facing institutions like libraries are. Um, so ensuring that in a digital environment and in an analog environment, we have institutions that are going to be here for hundreds of years, like the Library Company of Philadelphia, like the Free Library of Philadelphia, like the Athenaeum in Boston, or the Boston Public Library, or the big, uh, big university libraries. We need those players to be in this um, uh, in the same business to ensure that we actually have our historical and our cultural record over time. And at the same time, I think we should do this not just in a local context. I've argued primarily that libraries should be serving local needs and, and meeting community needs, and I think that's so. But I also think we can do this in a global environment in a way that will be very, very powerful. So as we create very great uh, local uh, institutions and state institutions, and as we build a national digital library system, I think we should do so in a global environment and recognize um, that if we imagine a series of digital libraries on a national scale, um, we can also imagine them connecting to one another. So the very first thing that in creating the Digital Public Library of America, um, we did the first agreement we reached was actually with Europeana, which is a system in Europe that is taking all the national libraries that are cropping up around Europe and making sure that when we digitize materials and they digitize materials, we have a similar system so that somebody could actually search across those, those systems. Um, and the point is not to make every one of these national digital library systems the same, but to make them similar enough, to make them interoperable so that they can work together. And to demonstrate this, the first uh, exhibit that we created was not just a national exhibit from the US, but it was a joint exhibit with Europeana that looked at immigration. So it looked at the progress uh, for somebody going from the old world to the new, or the new world to the old, and it took collections from both places and showed how they could be interoperable. So I don't think we have to build a worldwide library. I think that would be impossible. We would all never agree. You think about how the United Nation works and how slow that goes. Um, but actually, I think instead of having 200 libraries that are exactly the same around the world at a national level, we can just agree on certain things that make sure that somebody who is searching across them can actually find the information they need. So a global vision can be one that's highly interoperable and interconnected, but without actually all being the same. We can have the benefits of diversity, in other words, um, while also having um, the benefit of interconnection. Um, this is a map of utopia, if it wasn't obvious. Um, and my sense is, of course, that um, it would be great for us to have the utopian library of the future. I don't, I'm not naive enough to think that's so. Um, but what I would urge us to do at this moment, at this historic moment, is actually think about what we think the future of libraries ought to be and to seek to build toward that, rather than to have various forces um, press in on libraries. So um, my view is, if we can imagine 
what would be an incredible democratic serving version of the digital library in an analog world um, and then build toward that as much as possible that that would be um, the soundest way to go and the soundest way for our democracy. Um, as we proceed, I think it's crucial that it be done in collaboration. I think this is a key to success for libraries that we um, don't compete as institutions but rather agree to work together. Um, and I actually think a great deal turns on this moment. A great deal turns on our ability to figure out how to create something that's a system as opposed to a series of standalone institutions. Um, and if we do so, I'm completely convinced that we can create a library system that is greater um, as a whole than the sum of its parts. And I'm totally convinced that rather than having a system that will exacerbate um, the, the big gap between the haves and have nots, we can create something that's actually vastly more effective for democracy um, than the system we've had in the past. And I hope that you will join me in helping to build it. Thank you so much. I also hope that if you have questions or disagreements or uh, other things to say, you will uh, let us have a mic come over to you and, uh, and ask away. Just one question is um, the help for the creators. Mm -hmm. Like someone told me in England, when someone takes out a book, the author always gets something back mm. for that. And I know with the internet, one of the biggest problems is the people who create the work are losing money. Mm -hmm. So is there something? It's a super important question. I mean, I think, I think in, in whatever ecosystem we create or system that we create, it's essential that authors get paid for their work. I think it would be a terrible system if somebody couldn't, uh, you know, try to make a livelihood as, as an author. Um, I believe that librarians can be, and libraries can be a huge support for that. So the collection budgets for libraries that are supported by public funds, I think should continue to be, to be doing that. So no version of this future in my mind should be one in which authors are not paid for their work. I think publishers should be paid um, and should, should have a role in the system. I just think that it needs to be one where there is a public option at some point. So I absolutely agree that, that authors and libraries should get compensated, libraries should compensate authors. Um, I don't think it should be a necessarily um, uh, on the terms that the publishers are asking for now, but I think it needs to be on a sustainable basis. Um, I think you could imagine a digital world in which it is a per lend basis. In other words, if you have, if my book gets lent 10 times in the city of Philadelphia and someone else's book gets lent out 100 times, that I would get paid less than the person who um, had a more popular book, that would be fine. In fact, there are a series of systems that have been designed, so-called alternative compensation systems that could work on that basis. And I think that's part of the moment we're in now is, is there going to be a business model that could sustain libraries, allow them to lend out um, works on just as free a basis as they have in the past, and which does sustain authors uh, and publishers in a great way. Um, I would say there's one zone in which I think we should change the model, though, and which would undercut publishers in one way, um, which is I think we should go to an open access model for scholarly works in general. So um, many people here may work in a university setting, um, and some universities have taken a pledge that says when you publish an article, particularly one that's been paid for through federal research dollars, but really any article, um, that that article ought to be made available on the web as an open access journal. I feel very, very strongly that those materials, particularly those paid for um, by public funds, should be, should be shared. Now, who would that undercut? There are some for-profit publishers who would make less money in that environment. Um, but I actually think that the good to the democracy of that change and the good for scholarship um, would vastly outweigh the, um, the, the cost of doing that. Please. Hi, so I'm an academic librarian. Oh, great. <laughs> and my question is about copyright. Mm -hmm. And I, I guess I have a couple, the, it sounds like DPLA sounds like an incredibly noble project. Oh, and I'm good. ready to sign up for a scan Please. of data. Um, but <laughs> uh, in dealing with our open access policy, there's two giant strangleholds, I think. And one is copyright. Mm -hmm and dealing with copyright, which because I think that's put handcuffs on scholarship and, and access to materials. And the other is the consolidation of uh, media outlets, the consolidation mm -hmm. of publishing, the consolidation of television, radio, all that, all that. And so how is that impacting what you're doing and what are your strategies for overcoming this? I think it's a great question. So in many of the conversations about the future of knowledge and libraries, Copyright is the sort of elephant in the room, and it's a very difficult, very difficult topic. Um, so let's 
take for a moment your, your question about uh, the journals and open access publishing and the consolidation of the number of publishers. One of the big concerns right now, of course, is the cost of getting access to some scholarly journals, which can run in the tens of thousands of dollars a year for a subscription with a relatively small and growing smaller group of publishers. Now, there's some value added by some of these publishers, to be clear, but in most cases, the talent is actually out of the university or out of the research community. In fact, the entire process is in some case that way. So think about this. If you are in a field in which you are writing a scholarly article um, and you get a grant from a public agency or from a uh, research institution or you get it from a, a, a private foundation, you do the work yourself and you publish the article. Who is it that is actually reviewing that article and editing it? It's one of your peers, right? It's peer reviewed by another academic, right, who does the peer review. Um, often it's then a for-profit that is then publishing it. But then you say, who is actually paying the licenses to the publishers? Again, it's the academic libraries. So what has been created is this very strange environment in which the talent that creates it is the um, is the uh, the author in this case a professor paid for by the university. The talent who edits and peer reviews it is in fact another professor at another university. The talent who acquires it is the librarian at the academic institution, um, and the one making all the money is the for-profit publisher. This to me is a crazy arrangement, right? So the key in that whole in this particular zone is in the first instance for the academics to say no. We won't publish in this way, or at a minimum, we'll publish in this way, but we will require that a version of this be able to be made open access. And as you know, the National Institute of Health and others have been very helpful in this respect. Some universities, and Harvard is one of them, have, where the, the Harvard Law School and the Faculty of Arts and Sciences and the various schools have said, we require our faculty, in fact, to publish this way. So I would hope that every university and every kind of research institution would just take this pledge, the open access pledge. It's not to say you can't publish it in the, the for-profit journal, but you're always agreeing to make a version of it um, available for free on the web, open access. And in that case, if somebody can't afford tens of thousands of dollars for the journal, they don't have to. You can actually get access to that knowledge. Copyright law does not ban that in any way. That is completely consonant with the U.S. copyright law. Right? It is only about making a pledge and standing up and saying, well, this is, we're only going to license a certain version of it to the publisher. So that's entirely possible. Now, the place where it's trickiest is in books, which is particularly um, for the books that are uh, you know, in the, uh, in the modern era, um, and they're the books that, um, where nobody's going to agree to publish at open access, where authors need to get compensated to, uh, to make their livelihood. As a professor, I didn't need any money, and you don't get paid any money, actually, to write those journal articles. Authors do need money to get their books. That's a slightly different arrangement, and I think that would require a different way that's consonant with copyright to address it. But you point to the gnarliest of the topics in the middle of this future. Um, but I think there's much more that we could do that is consistent with the copyright regime than we do today. Thank you. Yes, sir. But, professor, as, as an educator, my question is how do you respond to my assumption that uh, digital library encourage instrumentalism as, as let, let's be bullet and say uh, uh, digital library, this digital education in general encourage instrumentalism while physical library, if, if, if it will be done right, it will teach, uh, it will create creativity. It will also teach us intellectual courage, intellectual humility, not to mention intellectual integrity. So if I understood the question correctly, the, the, uh, it goes to how we can teach creativity and intellectual rigor and so forth in, uh, in this new environment. And as an educator, I think I couldn't agree with you more that part of what we need to do is to ensure that our students, our young people are encouraged to think in a very broad way, to think in a creative way, in an innovative way. I think one thing that we often imagine is that our kids are able to do this intuitively, that they know how to work that iPhone better than you do right when they get it, or they know how to use the web better than others do just because they're a kid. And it turns out while they may have some easy facility at the first, first part of it, they actually need literal support to figure out how to use it um, in more sophisticated ways. And actually, that's one of the reasons that I think human beings, librarians, are essential to this whole picture. And that's true whether it's a digital environment or an analog uh, environment. Um, I had an experience that 
uh, during writing, writing of this book, I went to different libraries and sat in different places to be inspired as I wrote it. Um, and I was at the local library near me, the Memorial Hall Library in Andover, Mass. And I sat there, um, it was a, uh, a, a day on which a bunch of students came in at, uh, in the middle of the afternoon and they kind of streamed past me into the teen area. Um, and the kids were doing a project, clearly, um, on terminal velocity. And so a kid turns to his cell phone in the middle of this library and says, Siri, you know, the guy from, the, the character from Apple, Siri, what does terminal velocity mean? Right into the iPhone. And Siri had absolutely no idea. But I was thinking, you know, the librarian sitting right over there, she definitely knows what terminal velocity means. And more important, that librarian could actually teach you how to go find it within this library. That would be a much better answer. Um, so I think that having humans, whether it's in the digital environment or in the physical environment, is crucial to this question of being creative and being innovative. Um, I just think sometimes that the role of that librarian is going to shift in this digital era um, to doing slightly different things, to be guides in a different way um, than they have been in the past. Thank you. Yes, sir. Uh, thanks for your uh, interesting discourse. Thank you I for coming. Thank you very much. I want to inquire um, with the curtailing in the eradication of um, public schools, libraries, I wanted to ask you, had, did you find any information on what the future of public school libraries will look like? What a great question. I, I think that in the context of my study, I talked to a bunch of people who work in school libraries, and they're such inspiring people who are working in these libraries. Um, also, if you think about the scale of public school libraries, in the United States, they're on the order of 100 and something thousand, 125,000 libraries, period. Um, more than 100,000 of those are school libraries. So the bulk of the libraries in this country are public school libraries. And one of the things that you can find from the, the surveys and the data is that schools that have great school libraries have higher performance academically among their kids. Now, you can make an argument that this is only a correlation, not causation, and it's a little hard to prove causation, but at a minimum, it's a really strong correlation. So if you were running a school, why in the world would you cut the school library out? Why would you cut out that school library? It's not a lot of money. It's a great person often. It's a person who you know, can play a lot of roles in the school and can actually do a huge amount of teaching that is really, really important for kids. And, and these are some of the best teachers in the school. At the, uh, the school I'm a principal of, we have an amazing library called the Oliver Wendell Holmes Library. And those librarians are really some of the best teachers on our faculty. Why in the world would you cut them out of the equation? So I'm a huge, huge supporter. And there's, there's no question but that um, school libraries have a major role to play going forward. Yes, ma'am. Okay, I'm so glad I don't. I'm a librarian who's really loud because we have the microphone. Excellent, but there, this is being um, recorded for book TV, so uh, <laughs> if you can speak into um, the mic, that'll okay. make Okay, um, I'm a high school audible. librarian, and Thank I you. think um, we're kind of at this pivotal part. I mean, I'm in New Jersey, mm -hmm. but I think um, uh, we've asked to become the leaders in technology in our schools. Great. We've asked for more and more technology, and we've finally gotten it. And now we've been turned into computer labs mm -hmm. for standardized testing mm. and shut down for Many weeks. Uh, weeks, you know, for in New wow. Jersey for the park testing, which has become, you know, we um, park in Massachusetts too. So, you know, we, we try to become essential and then, you know, we're either proctoring exams or if we're not proctoring, the, the library is shuttered because it's filled with students that are taking digital tests that used to take a day when we took them on paper and now take, you know, I'm in a high school with 2,200 kids, take, you know, it took a week to administer the first half of the park. Um, so I don't know if there's, you know, how we can advocate better to, to maintain that role in a library when there seems to be, and it's not just New Jersey with standardized testing, um, you know, to, to kind of move libraries more toward, um, you know, how we kind of find our, struggle to find our role and, and keep our foot in the door. I think we're the best resource in the library. And um, when, you know, the, the advent of technology turns us into um, a computer lab versus a library. Yeah, something else, totally. You raise an incredibly good point. I think partly what's going on here is a conflation of two things. It sounds like 
the story started out really well, which was you made a really good argument and you had enlightened leadership who supported you and, you know, and, um, and that the transformation is well underway. At the same time, there's this freight train running through the story, which is the commitment to standardized tests that I think is taking over our educational system in a not good way, just to be clear. Um, one thing I might encourage you to do, we have next week coming to our school a woman named Anya Kamenitz who's written a book called The Test um, and she's coming to talk about this and it is a great book. So vastly better than my book is this book called The Test and you should read it um, and it, it looks at this question of why are we so committed to standardized tests and um, it looks at you know the Park test and the others that, that go with it. Um, it's a very critical look but it also I think it gets at some of the societal reasons behind it. So anyway, having her come as a speaker to your town might be a way to do it. Um, uh, but, but I think there's, there's also something deeper, again, at what you're getting, getting at. And this is something I fear for all kinds of libraries, which is if libraries turn into nothing more than a community center, um, where only it's just a venue to have events or something that is unrelated necessarily to um, the traditional work of libraries, I think that's actually a loss, right? Um, so I think keeping the connection to what you do so well as teachers and connectors um, of kids to ideas and to skills and so forth, that is so essential. Um, I hope that during the other 50 weeks of the year or whatever it is that you're, you, you know, are able to, to make that case, um, but, but I completely see the tension that, that you're pointing to. Um, I think it really, really goes to this notion of figuring out what the role is that's a positive version of librarianship that people can kind of understand really immediately um, and see the value and see the connection to what kids do. Um, one very particular thing, if, if you're thinking about those tests in, in, in specific, is at least the Common Core itself has a whole lot around media skills. It seems to me, who is better? Than teaching that than you guys. I mean, if you have to embrace the whole testing thing, then one you know sort of co-option of it might be to say, okay, we're the best teacher of this, and then um, have that be you know a key part of your role. But that's a slightly different. That's more of a strategic question or a tactical question than it is necessarily resolving the problem. But yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think we want to have a part. Yes. In Evaluate sources and and things like that, but it is it's a real challenge when then the resources get locked. Right. So you absolutely are you are crucial to, well, to oh, that process. Oh, we think we are. Person. We just yeah. would like the testing to go on elsewhere, elsewhere and to yeah. take shorter a shorter period of time. But right. I suspect that that lots of teachers and lots of families will agree with you, and, and I think that's a um, that's making an important argument separately. So anyway, the test is a good good answer. Anything else? Yes, sir. I'm a librarian too. Awesome. Um, and uh, a friendly was, crowd tonight. Yeah, here, librarians. Right. Um, so I was curious about the metadata that you're using in the DPLA. Mm -hmm. um, what classification system are you using? I assume it must be standardized. Yes. But. Um, so there was a, a, a really fun kind of two-year period that was. Um, uh, trying to go across the country and say, if we were gonna do this, how do we, how do we come up with something that's kind of simplified? Um, Dublin Core was certainly you know, part of that, that conversation. Um, the, the idea is, is to have something that is standardized enough but allows for kind of extensibility over time, knowing that we are not going to um, uh, know exactly what's, what's gonna be needed. So uh, amazingly enough, the group did um, come together around uh, a data model and we've also agreed on that data model with Europeana and some others, um, and uh, I was a little bit surprised that that it, that it worked out okay, but but it has, and uh, I expect over time there will be continued negotiations. Um, related to that, we had to come to some common agreements around licensing. So when you um, when you have materials, on what basis will you accept them? And that's um, that's a similar sort of challenge around standardization. And all these geeky things have these really great committees that work on it. And if you are interested, we'd love to have you uh, part of that. So, thank you. Last question, yes, please. If there's one more. Thank you. Um, I live in a little town called Prospect Park, just south of the Philadelphia International Airport, and I'm on the My Library Board. Oh, great. And we struggle with our um, borough to fund us. Uh -huh. um, they've pretty much funded us the same amount for many, many, many years, and we're grateful to get it, but we do a lot of um, fundraising to try yep. to keep the library going. I fear for the, the kids of today because they're, they're making so many cuts in education. Um, the arts is pretty much has disappeared in public schools and I think our library does a pretty good job with um, having arts programs um, and things like that for the children. 
Um, do you have any advice for um, board members mm -hmm. to what kind of arguments can we bring to the table to help us convince our public officials that libraries matter in the community? Well, thank you for, this is a perfect one to end on because um, as I write in the first chapter of the book, I wrote this book actually not for the librarians whom I love who are here in the audience, but I actually wrote it for other people trying to make the case. And very specifically, I wrote it for people like you who are board members and for people who are um, in decision-making postures around making budgets, whether it's principals of high schools like me or town managers or select people or whatever it might be who you know are trying to decide on the budget. So um, that is exactly the point of this book and I hope it's, it, it proves to be useful to you and I imagine you could borrow it from your local public library if you don't wish to buy it, which would be good. And if you do, you can use an independent bookstore to buy, uh, um, to buy it. Um, I mean, it is the core of my argument that these are extraordinarily important institutions to democracies. Um, and that I think for towns, this is extremely short money for the return that you get. I don't have an economic model that we could make one up, but I actually think it would be probably just made up. Um, but I think we all know the importance of these libraries to, um, to our kids, to our seniors, to people who are seeking jobs, um, to people who are trying to do creative and innovative things. Um, I think so many ways uh, libraries, particularly public libraries, serve a core function in our democracy. And right now, we are expecting of libraries to do things that they've always done that are in this physical and analog way, and we're expecting libraries to do these cool and innovative digital things. And we're just giving libraries the same amount of money they've always had. That it just the math doesn't add up, right? We've still got to pay librarians. We've still got to um, have collections, and we need to have more research and development today. So um, I think towns need to step up. I think individual citizens do, and people like me need to write checks to our friends of the library. And I think you know institutions that make grants like the Knight Foundation have to do that, or the Penn Foundation. And I think this is a real a moment where uh, we need to actually put more resources into librarians and libraries to get over this this uh, transition and really to take advantage of what's right in front of us. So bless you for being on a library board as a non-librarian and I, I wish you great luck with the borough uh, founding or the, the, the fathers and mothers who oversee the, oversee the town to the Free Library of Philadelphia. Thank you for the chance to be here. Have a great night.